today, this evening, in the book of Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to finish chapter 6. We began that chapter two weeks ago as we began to study the life of Noah, the life of Noah. And we've titled the message today, The Provision of God and the Obedience of Noah. Two things that we see as we study the life of Noah from chapters 5 to 8 of the book of Genesis, the provision of God, notice that, and the obedience of Noah. It's been said before that Noah is the smartest businessman in the Bible, if you didn't know that. He is the smartest businessman in the Bible because he was able to float stock while the rest of the world was in liquidation. If you don't get it now, you'll get it later. But he was a man that was strong in faith. He was a man that was strong in God's word. He was a man of follow through. And if there's anything that we need today is men and women, Christian men and women of the Bible with a Christian worldview that have follow through. What does that mean? That you begin something and you follow through with what God has called you to do. That we would not become specialists of startup, but never following through in obedience. This means that as you study the life of Noah, he was a man that finished what God called him to do in obedience. What did he do? He proceeded steadily and faithfully obeying, slow and steady obeying for 120 years, that grace period that God had established so that he can build the ark as his family would be saved from the judgment of the flood. And we learn the character of Noah that he trusted and obeyed. Would you write that down in your Bible, maybe notebook this evening? He trusted and obeyed. Today we want to trust and obey. He was named in the hall of faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And it says this, by faith Noah, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Think about that. By faith, he trusted in what God said when he was warned about things that he had not yet seen. No one had seen rain up until this point since creation. And by faith, having been warned of things that had never been seen before, this is the ultimate expression and example of walking by faith and not by sight. This is by faith, even when he didn't see it. What did he do? He moved with godly fear. He obeyed even when he could not explain it. Notice, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which the, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith and according to faith, he became now an heir of righteousness. Now notice as he trusted and obeyed God, he didn't try to negotiate with God. Now, how many times has God called you to do something and you try to negotiate with him as to what you're willing to do and you say, well, I'm, I don't want to do that part, Lord. <laughs> Noah trusted in God. He obeyed God that he worshiped without excuses. He obeyed without excuses. That was the character of Noah. He trusted and obeyed. But what about the character of God? In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, would you write this down? 1 Peter 3, 20, it says that the character of God was explained through the flood. In fact, not only his holiness, but his long-suffering with man, it says, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited. In the days of Noah, waited. He waited. He was long-suffering for 120 years during that grace period before he would send judgment upon the whole earth. Well, the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. We learn through the story of the flood an account of the character of Noah, a man that was righteous, the character of God who was long-suffering and just. He was patient and holy. He is righteous and loving, but also the signs of the times through this passage. Why? Because 
It is a backdrop of sin and rebellion. It was during the time of the days of Noah when man had been corrupted by sin. They had turned their back on the standard that God had placed since the Garden of Eden. And the conditions in which the world began from the coming of now this time are the same conditions that we will find here on earth before the coming of Jesus. In fact, Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, Jesus said this, but as the days of Noah were, just as the days of Noah, the backdrop of rebellion, the backdrop of sin, the backdrop of turning away against God or away from God, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will the coming of the Son of Man be, as in the days of Noah. What was happening during these days? We see there was an exploding population that we studied. There was sexual perversion taking place. Demonic activity that you see here between the sons of God and the sons of man. There was constant evil in the heart of, ma of man and the mind of man. Constant evil. There was a widespread of corruption and violence that took over the earth. And those same qualities you see today, which tells us that we're living in a time just like or much like the days of Noah. What does it mean? What does it tell us? What is this an indication of? That we are truly living in the last days. And we can trust, because of Scripture, that Jesus is coming soon. How many of you believe that he is coming soon? Amen. We can trust he's coming soon. So here in chapter 6, we're going to look at three things. A faithful man who worshiped God. Number one, a faithful man who worshiped God. Number two, an obedient man who worked for God. An obedient man who worked for God. And then number three, a secure man who waited on God. What do we learn here? How to worship, how to work, and how to wait on God. Today, we're going to learn how to be better worshipers, workers and how to wait on God it begins here in chapter 6 of Genesis verse 8 where we left off it says but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord let's pray Lord we thank you we ask as Noah found grace that today we would find grace Lord that we would be worshipers that we would be believing Lord that you are the creator that you are the sovereign God over all things of the universe, of the heavens, and of the earth. And that we would find grace because we're seeking it. We would find grace because we are humbling ourselves before you. And because of your grace, we would then be counted righteous. So we thank you and we ask that you would speak to us so that we can trust and obey, Lord. There's no other way. That we wouldn't look to negotiate with you, that we wouldn't look to make excuses that we wouldn't make reservations in our hearts, but that we would be open, available, ready for you to speak to us in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. Now notice there in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the midst of a backdrop of sin and rebellion, it gives us a contrast in regards to the life of Noah. But Noah found grace, a comparison. And who did he find grace before? He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This undeserved gift, grace. Grace is receiving that which we do not deserve. And he found grace. Who? A man that believed in God. A man that knew that God was the creator, that he was sovereign over all things. A man who worshiped the Lord here. And he uses this word that's very important. We took note of it two weeks ago. That says that he found grace in the eyes of God. He didn't earn grace. Notice, nobody earns grace. We all find grace in God's eyes. And that's true today. Today, we find grace. This is an illustration of redemption. That in the midst of corruption, here was a man who found grace. That where there was sin, grace abounded much more. Today, know this, even as it was then, as God's word says in Romans 5.20, but where sin abounded there on that day, the day of Noah, grace also abounded much more. So he was a sinner, just like us, saved by grace. 
Now, grace here is what saved him from the judgment. It was because of grace that he experienced salvation from the judgment that was to come. Isn't the same now reminder, illustration that we receive, and we know that today we are saved from judgment because of grace? What a picture we have there in the Old Testament, that he was saved from the judgment by grace. Today, you are saved from judgment because of grace as well. Now, notice here the three qualities of a godly character. Three qualities of godly character. It says this in verse 9. This was the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, number one. He was just. He was righteous. And why was he righteous? He was righteous after he found grace. Notice number two, he was perfect, or you can write the word blameless there, which means he had integrity. He was not corrupted by the sinful world. He was an uncorrupted man in a corrupted world. He was, he was a holy man in an unholy world. It's so easy today to be influenced by the world around us that we slowly start to compromise. And you know what compromise leads? Compromise always leads to corruption. But we see here that he was perfect. That means that he did not compromise, that he was blameless, that he was undivided, that he had integrity now. He didn't compromise in a compromising world. Now, notice what it says because it's described two things about Noah. His now relationship before God, he was righteous, but also his relationship before man, he was blameless. Blameless doesn't mean that he was sinless. It means that this man had integrity, that he was undivided, he was unblemished, he was without accusation because his heart was wholly given over to God. So he was righteous, he was also blameless, and number three, as you look at that verse also, he walked with God. That's exactly what we want to be today, that we would be a people that will trust and obey God, and that you see it in our lives as we are, number one, righteous, right before God, as we walk in holiness, number two, we're blameless in our conduct, and also we're consistently walking with God. God. Now, what is the first step of walking with God? Putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's exactly how we start walking with God. And it says there in verse 10, notice his sons, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now, as it's mentioned here, Noah, it describes him as the remnant, it describes him as the minority. He had a family, but the world was corrupt. Have you noticed in Scripture as you read the Old Testament and even through the New Testament that God's witnesses often have stood alone in a world that is rejecting God? Notice, Noah stood alone in the civilization, in this culture of progress where many ridiculed him because he was building an ark of something that yet had not seen. <laughs> well, you think about Elijah who stood alone against the priest, the priest of, of, of Baal, and those who sat there and ate at Jezebel's table, standing alone again. Jeremiah, a man who stood alone against those that were pro prophesying falsely of peace when there was no peace. Daniel in the Old Testament, what happens with him? He also stood alone and spoke for truth. And what happened to him? He was in the lion's den. <laughs> But these were all men in the Bible that God found whose hearts were loyal to him. What does the Bible say in 2 Chronicles 16.9? For the eyes of the Lord go to and fro through the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God is looking for people whose heart is loyal to him, not loyal to this world, whose hearts are not divided between him and the world. And it says, in this you've done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. So what do we learn here about Noah? That he was a man that was willing to stand alone and that his faith in God and that his works were working together. It wasn't only that he trusted, it was also that he obeyed. In James, in the New Testament, what does he tell us? There are some that say that they have faith but have no works. He said, some will tell you, look at my faith by my words, but I'll tell you, look at my faith because, or I'll show you my faith in my works. 
In James chapter 2, 14, he says this, What then does it profit my brother if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Noah here demonstrated that he wasn't only a professor of his faith, he also was a possessor of his faith. And because he had faith, he found grace and he was righteous in the eyes of God. Now notice verse 11 as it continues because it says that the earth was corrupt. Why? Because Satan had completely dominated the world, had polluted the world, and the earth was filled with violence. Now verse 12, so God looked upon the earth and indeed it was again, second time, it uses this word, corrupt. For all flesh had, number three, corrupted their way on the earth. Did you see how after the garden, what took place? Corruption. As you look through the Bible, you see here that first you had creation, and then what happens after creation and fellowship with God, then you have corruption because of sin. And after you have corruption because of sin, notice what happens after, then you have confusion. <laughs> what happens after you have confusion because of the corruption? They try to build the Tower of Babylon. And the Lord confuses them, creates nations, separates the people. Confusion throughout the entire Old Testament, all the way from Genesis to Malachi. In the book of Matthew, after confusion, guess what you have? Christ. And Christ is introduced there in the Gospels. And after Christ, then you have the cross. Our salvation, our redemption. And it takes us all the way through Revelation at the end, where then you are learning of the consummation. Where he's going to judge evil once and for all, and then now introduce the new heavens and the new earth. And here you see the midst of corruption. What happened? The earth had been corrupted. We have to protect our hearts so that we don't allow corruption to come in, so that we remain people that are blameless, that it doesn't matter who's around you. It doesn't matter the, the environment that you're in. Notice what happens. It doesn't matter the environment that you're in. You remain blameless that you're not easily influenced by others, you're not easily influenced by the world. This was a man who walked with God. This was a man who worshipped God, a blameless man who worshipped God, but notice number two, an obedient man who worked for God. Because from verse 14 to verse 22, notice what it says, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, and the earth is filled again with violence, through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Here you see that God's moving in holiness, God's moving in righteousness, in judgment. And you see that, that Noah here is moved or is mobilized by the word that he's received from the Lord. So God gives him instructions. And here it's very important that we listen to these instructions because we are responsible to respond to the instructions that God has given us given to us as he has given us an exact way as how he wants us to obey. So he says, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. And this was very important because he's saying, make a large boat, a water vessel, a cypress wood. This was waterproof. And notice what he's going to tell him. I want you to make rooms in the ark, in this massive giant water vessel, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Pitch was now used to cover that wood as a covering. It's the same word that we see as described in the Bible for the word of atonement in the Old Testament. Cover it. <laughs> this is interesting because we see ark, the ark here as a form of salvation. And notice in verse 15, he gives a measurement, specifics. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits is width five cubits, its height 30 cubits, verse 15, 450 feet long. What, how f long is that? It's, imagine this, one and a half football fields. That is, a, that is a large area and a boat there. 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. It's as high as a 30-story building. Now, now you know why it took him 120 years to build this ark. Him and eight people. But he didn't make an excuse. He said, God, you've called me to do this regardless 
of how difficult this is, I'm going to finish what you've told me to do. But notice verse 16, it says, you shall make a window for the ark. Praise God for that window. I mean, think about that smell. For that long period of time, with all those animals in there, he needed a window so the smell can come out, but also that he would receive sunlight and also water. And notice what it takes place. And you shall finish it to a cubit from above. So it was a window that went throughout the entire ark above 18 inches and set a door on the ark in its side, one door on its side. Verse 16, you shall make it with lower second and third decks. So three decks on that ark. You have to understand here that he is now being an obedient man that is working for God. It speaks to us. And in verse 17, notice what he tells them further. It says, and behold, I will make myself or I am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which the breath of life is. Everything that is on the earth shall die. What does that sound like? That God was going to wipe out mankind and creation and start all over again because the world had become corrupted. Everything that has life, notice, will die. I will destroy it. Not because of simply his judgment, but because of his holiness because of his righteousness. And in verse 18, notice as it continues, but I will establish my covenant with you. I want you to underline that in your Bible. That is the first time you see the word covenant in Scripture. I will establish my covenant with you. He is confirming his word personally to Noah. That word covenant is a word that expresses how God relates to man. I will establish a promise with you, an agreement with you, a promise here. Isn't it awesome? Every time God calls you to do something, he gives you a promise. Well, here he's given Noah a promise. And he says this in verse 18, as we continue reading, you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you. What does this mean? That God always provides a way of escape. That he doesn't judge the righteous with the unrighteous. This is why we know God is so just that he will not judge the righteous with the unrighteous. He will always make a way of escape. He will always make a way of salvation. And then he gives them instruction in regards to the animals. It says, of the birds, notice, or of every living thing in verse 19, of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female too, one male and one female. Why? To protect and to keep all creatures alive on earth after the flood. Of the birds of their kind, of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you and you will keep them alive. And notice what happens here. How is he going to get two of every type of animal into the ark? It's interesting here because this is God's sovereignty. You could just imagine when it was time for the animals to be brought into the ark. It says that he would bring them in, but we see the sovereignty of God that he would bring the animals to Noah. You just can imagine all the people that were unbelieving, that were ridiculing Noah. All of a sudden, all the animals start coming to Noah. And still yet, they were not convinced that there would be a flood. Still, they remain hard in their rebellion, regardless of the signs now. Notice verse 20, of the birds of their kind, of every animal and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come and you will keep them alive and you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten. Every type of food that is necessary, bring it in the ark with you and gather it to yourself and it shall be food for you and you will bring also food for them. Now, many people believe that all the animals that he brought into the ark were baby animals, so they would all fit. And some even believe that God caused the animals to go into a possible state of hibernation during that time. But it says here that that Noah had enough food for his family and for the animals. And it says, take enough food. But here, verse 22, you see his obedience. Thus Noah did. Not only did Noah receive instructions, 
But it said, thus Noah did according to what? According to all that God commanded him, so he did. You see, there is the example that we receive that he fully obeyed, not partially obeyed, because partial obedience is just as bad as disobedience. And it said that he obeyed everything. He didn't leave anything undone. This was his courageous obedience. In fact, the New Living Translation writes it this way, so Noah did everything exactly to God as God had commanded him. There are so many times that God commands us to do something, and what do we do? We like to change the plan. We like to alter the plan. No, it says that he did it exactly the way that God called him to do it. Why? Because he was trusting in God's covenant. He was trusting in God's unconditional promises. I want you to know something tonight. God always leads steps of faith with promises. Did you remember that? That God leads us with promises. He stepped out trusting in him who gives promises. That's why today, even as God has called us to obey him, what do we do? We lean in to the promises and to the word of God. What happens when we hold on to God's promises when we're stepping out in faith? What do they do? They give us peace and they also give us confidence. Aren't you so grateful that God is that gracious? That he's saying, I'm going to call you to do something, but I'm going to give you a promise. And you know what the promise is for? So that when it becomes difficult, the promise is there to give you peace and also to give you confidence that I've called you to do this. And you see here that Noah obeyed exactly what God told him to do. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 22, speaks of how we should not only be hearers, but also what doers. That we shouldn't only receive God's word, but we also should live it out in obedience. Write this down. James 1, 22, it says, but be doers of the word, not only hearers, deceiving yourself. Don't lie to yourself about how you're living your life. Don't lie to yourself about the compromise that you're allowing. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, immediately forgets what kind of man he was. It has no impact. It has no effect. He looks in the mirror. He says, you know what? I can see how I, I look, my appearance. I know that I have things to change. But you turn around, and it has absolutely no impact or evidence that you have been exposed to a mirror. What does the mirror do oftentimes for us? It exposes all of our imperfections. Have you ever stood before a mirror? And as soon as you look, you look away quickly. I don't like that mirror, sometimes we say. And others we say, you know what, it, it's, it's the lighting in this room. That's why, that's the problem. Oftentimes, we think the problem is with the mirror. It's not with the mirror, because the mirror is God's word, and his word is perfect. You know what it's doing? It's exposing all of our imperfections. Don't be like one who looks at the mirror, walks away, he's a forgetful here, but be a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. What are we called as we see Noah's life? Don't be a hearer, be a doer. Be a doer, not only a hearer. But now because Noah was obedient, notice what also happens. The Lord now was with him and his home, his family was not destroyed when the storms came. Do you see the blessing here in obedience? The storm was coming. But Noah had decided already to obey. And I want you to know there are storms that are coming in our lives. Are you ready to obey today? Because as we sang that song today, if the storms come and you're standing on that solid rock, you will not be wiped out. <laughs> but when the storms come, if you haven't obeyed his word and you're standing on the sand, it's all sinking sand. Write this down in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus said, therefore, whoever hears this saying of mine and does them, I will like them to a wise man who built his house on the rock. What an example of Noah that was building on obedience. Today, are you building on obedience? Or are you building on preference? Are you building on emotion? Are you building on pleasure? Are you building on what you want? And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat that house. 
and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears the sayings of mine and does not do them, I will liken him to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You see, Noah was about to enter into the storm. But how many of us here know that it's better to be with God in the storm? It's better to be with God in the storm than be anywhere else without him. It's better to be with God in the storm than anywhere else without him. Notice the confidence here as he's trusting God and obeying. Now, I want you to see something interesting here about Noah as we're studying his character and picking up these very important lessons for our own lives. And remember this, that Noah was not only building an ark. Noah was not only building an ark. He was also building godly character. When God calls you to build, notice you're not only building ministry, he's also building something in you. And he was building godly character as he was persevering, as he was being faithful, as he was obeying God, as he was warning people as a preacher of righteousness that the word tells us. He was building godly character in his obedience. But in his obedience also, men, women, parents, marriages, husbands, wife, listen to this, he was also building something else at the same time, a godly family. (laughs) You want to be like Noah in a world that is corrupted? Then be ready to build godly character and obedience while at the same time, God calling you to build a godly family. Now, this illustration of the ark is so important because without Noah, notice what would have happened. We wouldn't have Abraham. Without Abraham, we wouldn't have the Jewish nation. Without the Jewish nation, we would not have had the Savior of the world that would have gone to the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And I want you to know something, even as we close here in chapter 6 of Genesis, that Here we have the salvation element in the ark. Would you pay attention to this? As we look at the ark, there is a salvation element that it serves as a symbol of salvation for us. Number one, it was invented by God, not by man. Salvation is given to us by God. It's not in and of ourselves. Notice that the ark, that God gave him the specifics, the measurements, our salvation is given to us by God. It is by God's design. Do you see that God gave him the design of the ark? Our salvation is by God's design. We also see, number two, that the only way to be saved by judgment is to do one thing. What do we do? To get in the ark. (laughs) So many people today, I don't want to get in the ark. There are many arks to get into that will save me. You can think whatever you want. The flood's coming. There's only one that's going to save you. (laughs) There's only one salvation. And you know how we see that in the ark? It said that it had a what? One door. (laughs) Only one door. Do you remember the New Testament? What did Jesus say? I am the what? I'm the door. (laughs) What an example of salvation in the Old Testament. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is a way of escape from judgment for our salvation through that door, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. And today we want to lean, we want to trust in the Lord. We want to say thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to say today, we're trusting in you, we're trusting in your promises. We're trusting in what you have told us. We're leaning into your promises. We're not being influenced by the world. We're building on obedience. Today we want to build on what you have said, not what uh, what other people think. No one could have easily been distracted by the opinions of other people that were ridiculing him of his day. No one could have easily been discouraged by the comments of those that would walk by in rejection and mistreatment. No one could have easily been defeated by the thought in his mind that he had never seen rain. But you know what happened? It said 
that he did all that God had commanded him. Why? Because he was holding on to the promises of God. And when the storm came, when the judgment of God came, he and his family were saved. Can we pray that God would give us that heart, that we would obey the same way? Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we're so grateful, Lord, that you've given us this opportunity, Lord. To know, Lord, that you judge sin. Lord, but you are so graceful that you always provide a way of salvation. Lord, yes, you judge sin, but you always provide a way of salvation. And the way of salvation is, Lord, going through the door who is Jesus the only way of salvation is through you Jesus Christ I pray that we would respond Lord not only respond to your salvation but also after we have trusted you that we have obeyed and maybe today you are you're having a hard time when it comes to trusting and obeying God Maybe today you're saying, you know what, I, I've been saying that I trust God, but the obedience is really where I need strength in to make that decision to obey the Lord. Or I'm struggling with what God's calling me to do. Well, today I want to pray for you and say, you know what, only through His strength you're able to do this. It's not through your own strength, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. If today you need prayer, you say, you know, I, I, I need prayer because I want to trust Him and obey today in this season of my life. Would you just stand right there where you are? If you want to say, today I want to trust and obey because I know there's no other way. I know it's only in Jesus Christ. Just stand right there where you are because I want to pray for you.